first of all, how many of the people that are here were here for at the church the other day? I, I'm almost everybody. Okay, so uh, best is to start with that because some of these things you can get on the internet, and I'm actually alive here. <laughs> and if you actually experience something, then maybe we could talk about because the problem, one of the, we were just talking with that, what's your sociolo sociologist friend yesterday? Icho. Icho. We were talking about it, is that like the last two performances that I gave, uh, let's see where my camera is here, oh, it's there, <laughs> so we can see me and the backs of you, perfect. Um, um, we were talking about it because the last two performances that I gave, one was in Innsbruck a few days ago on a carillon, which is a bell instrument that's up in the church tower. And we had all these people down in a very nice square, also in the St. Um, Jacob's church. Are you okay? What's the problem? Just to read the sound. I'm sorry. Ah. I'm just here for this. Ah, ah okay. Um, so that was at St. Jacob's, and there was a carillon, and I was all the way up in the tower that took about 15 minutes to get to. I mean, so after it's finished, uh, I mean, I asked them to film it, but normally I like to have some relationship like we're having now. And, yes, and the other night also, that church where I was playing the organ, uh, also San Jacobs, it's, um, there's a kind of a wooden filigree in front of the, where the, where the organ plays, and so I w didn't have any contact with you guys. And actually, normally I do start downstairs in, or when, from time to time, I would have started downstairs, but we've been traveling for three weeks, I have a big shop in Vienna, and and, and, in, and in Innsbruck, I had to go up and down th this tower three times. And so I was actually tired. Otherwise, you would have heard, you would have seen me, and I would have seen you before I started. That's normally how I like to do it, because then I know I'm going to go up to the, to the um, bird's nest there, and then I won't see you anymore. Though in some churches, you can, if it doesn't have that filigree, you're up. But, so what I mean to say, position is quite important, especially in, in works like mine, because I'm a very physical guy. And so that's the paradox of playing what I call the most, the, the greatest synthesizers in the world. That's what I call organs. Um, that I didn't have any physical contact with you. So now I do, and so that's why I was thinking, let's start with that, because that's where, ooh, I came first, and you've already heard that, and maybe you have some questions and things, and then afterwards we can see some movies. Hmm. And, um, and maybe, like maybe, maybe and, can and you can even ask me some questions yeah. if you want. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> looks like you're in the question. Yeah, you're in the question place. Since you mentioned the performance. Yeah, wait. I want to see. Can you see the the video camera from where you are? No. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I do. No, so put yourself exactly so. I do. It usually yeah. it works that if you see it, yeah. it sees you. I yeah. found that that happens very often. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. And so I've used it because I don't like to use like, you know, mathematical principles, but if, yeah. if it's the, you see it, it sees you, and that works, that's a simple, much more simple. Um, ah, ah, so you're going to yeah, ask me some questions. You, you asked me after the performance, you asked me an interesting thing. Uh, you said that you got the feeling during the performance that, that the public on the concert were more keen to have a beginning, middle, and the end. No, I think you said that. <laughs> and then I, I said, <laughs> yeah, because you know this public. I don't, I don't know, how would I know that from being all the way up there? No. But, and that, well, we were talking about it, because you came up sort of perplexed a little bit because they didn't know how to clap at the end, and you, you thought, and then I started to sing, what that, what was that about? Where, where, where was that in the, in the program? Is he supposed to just sort of sing like that? Is that, you know, 
things like, yeah, see, the, this is the kind of guy I am. I never say what exact, I call a piece of the name of the piece, and then it's an incomprehensible name often, and then you don't know, it's, is it gonna be in several sections, or is it one section, and you don't know that. And, and actually, to, to be honest, I don't often know either, because I do it in the moment. And so um, there was, to yeah. bring up that point. Yeah, you said that you were then playing with the ambiguity of situation. Well, uh, something like that. But it, 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 we were just talking about yesterday about, um, like my approach is a very in the moment approach, just like how we just started now. And I, then I found out, I thought, why is that camera guy so absurd? He's an artist. Okay. So we, and that's part of, of my presentation. I mean, I, want, I don't want you to think that that was the pre-presentation. You can already consider that a part of this morning's presentation. If anybody says we need to. Well, first, you know, there was just, he was talking to the um, photographer. No, no, you say, it started by him talking to the photographer and confronting the photographer. And, and so we can, can already consider this the event. No, but it's, that's an important difference of what I do and some other people do, is that I, I like to be in the moment, I, and things begin as they begin. And normally I like even things to begin before they begin. So when you come in, they've already begun. Does that make any sense? It does. Okay. <laughs> so um, that's why, too, when they were going to have a speech, like I don't usually like speeches in my in my. So I had to. I said, "Well, if I have, if I make the noise up and the thing going wee 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 wee, and the, I don't know how you guys heard the speech downstairs. I couldn't. I just heard the rush. I didn't think of the sound because the sound was too. I said, "Is that okay? Because I don't like there's a speech and then I begin because it's I don't. It, that comes very early in my work. Is that I just I like it is a continuum and so continuums continue and they don't." If a continuum decontinues, it means there's something wrong. It doesn't mean that it's over. For other people, it means, yes, it's just over. Yeah, but I don't like over, so it's just. Uh, so. And this continuum. Okay, but I already, we already talked about that. Now. Yeah. They got it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let's go on to me. Yeah, you mentioned, you mentioned event. So how does this apply to your you know, video work? What does event mean? Lately, I mean, I've been, lately I've been very, I've, I'm like a little child <laughs> now. I've been, what, like, what is an event? What does that mean? And you know, there are words I've been hearing and using since I'm a little child, but lately maybe it's some kind of Alzheimer that I'm getting. But I really like, uh, all of a sudden, I use a word and it, that's why now I use all these different words with three T's and six M's and so, so it ambiguates all the possibilities. But what does like event come from? I don't know. Oh, okay. I mean. Does anybody know what event means? I mean, uh, I mean, événement in French, it means something that will happen. Événement. So event is something that will happen. So, okay. Yeah. Which already happened. Which already happened. Day. So it I want. On, it was on Friday. Yeah. And now we're Sunday. Yeah. Okay, great. So I wanted to ask Reality you, check. How, how does this transfer? You know, when you're traveling a lot, <laughs> you, you lose track of the, we're in hotels and different places now for three weeks. You lose track of when it's Sunday and Friday and which day. And more, more than if you're at home and you have all the thing, regular things around you uh, that, that give you sort of like the, your time and place. So I wonder how does this apply with, with your video work? You know, you have a camera, you have to start. Well, this was a very long time yeah. ago. Yeah. I mean, and now I have that little camera there that's documenting. Uh, this piece, I'm gonna play two, which is one of the, my earliest ones that were yeah, more than 40 years old, that were done with one of the earliest video art companies that ever existed and just to imagine how well that system went. The first, I was one of the first people to work in this video art system commercially. This was a commercial company from 
uh, Florence, Italy, called Art Tapes. And they eventually did 100 tapes. And then they went out of business. And uh, there were so many other companies that decided to continue in that way. Uh, Castelli Sama Band and uh, Electronic Arts Intermix now exists. So there were some companies here and there in the world. But video art especially uh, never made it as a, the, in this case, when I made these tapes, um, they're called Body Music 1 and Body Music 2. And they were made, this one was made in Paris in a room somewhere during a festival d'automne. Uh, it was Ileana Sanaband, who was a very important gallerist of the 70s and, well, and after she just died about 10 years ago. She was approached by these people, um, Art Tapes Florence, who had bought some equipment. Um, I don't know if any of you know um, um, Italian futurism, a little bit, uh, 20th century futurism. The woman who started it was the daughter of Primo Conti, who was a, a rather important Florence futurist, Italian futurist. So it was an artist family. Um, and she was into the new media. And so the new media meant all these big porta packs, Sony porta packs. I don't know if some of you would remember what that was like. And they weighed a ton. And, uh, and the cables, that, that was one of, the, uh, one of the pieces made up by the other. The cables were, were thick like this, not thin like that. And so um, that was the new technology is that an artist could then um, work directly with, and it's not film. So what happened is that then I did, Eventually, I became my own. I, I hated um, um, one thing that you'll find that's similar to my works even 45 years later is that I don't edit. It's in real time. It works or it doesn't work. Sometimes I have, we do sometimes enhance, like make sure that the sounds or the images we just, but it's always in real time. So that hasn't changed. From this piece that will start, that comes from 73, or I think it'll say, I forget if it's 73 or 74, until the, the piece you heard on Friday, no editing. Um, if, to, if we find that we like the, the work, maybe we'll edit out the non-applause that you did after it. <laughs> or maybe we'll put it in because it was such a non-applause he got up, we weren't sure what that was. So that might be even a reason to keep it in because then it makes it into some sort of strange, ambiguous communication that we have. Um, oh good, that's good. Um, now it's very, uh, maybe I'll touch this, so otherwise I'll fall asleep. It's like, it's like uh, back in the 60s, I still have one having that. An LSD. Um, so, um, so I never edit. I mean, we, we read, sometimes, like I say, enhance, if you come out with a record, because now I have lots of records, I used to have none. But, so, um, but I always, I don't redo, I don't um, cut, uh, normally I don't like to cut out, and so that's an attitude, even when I've now come out with works by other, with other um, um, musicians, and like Chris Chatham or Zev or um, um, Perlinex or um, um, Tony Conrad or whatever. Like the deal is we don't, we don't edit it. If we don't like it, we throw it out. We do like it, and most of the time, it, it, well, that's my speciality. I, I, I'm in the moment, and when I'm in the moment, I sort of am able to do things that I can't do when I'm out of the moment. I get into a trance, and then it just time passes in a sort of magical way. And so um, even this piece, I had no idea more or less what I was going to do. I'd never done a video before um, with my body in this uh, as a piece now in this what you what's called body music one. 
And so we're in this, I was invited to the festival at Tom with this woman who I worked with for over 40 years, a, a conceptual dancer, artist from the Judson, if any of you know the Judson um, movement in New York dance, uh, Von Rainer, uh, Tricia Brown, um, Lucinda Charles, and Simon Forti. Simon Forti and I worked together over these last 45 years. Even recently, there's been a sort of, um, we were given a sort of, a, people want to see this piece again, which we started in, in uh, 1970. And it was called Illuminations. Now I call it Illuminations, and you have to see that there are lots of S's, <laughs> lots of I's, lots of L's, lots of U's, lots of M's, lots of N's. Lots of, and, but that's another typical part of the way that I like to work. I come up with a title, and then the title uh, continues like, it, it, it's like a planet. It's not a title, it's a planet. And then all pieces in that sort of realm be, are those it's a, like Schlingenbling and is what I came up with for the organ piece in the 70s. And people ask me, well, what does that mean actually? And so actually it doesn't, well, it has a certain, I'll explain, but my reason for inventing such a kind of title is that I had sort of like joking with, you know, um, uh, all the titles of uh, um, Boulez and Stockhausen and Berio and Zanakisos, especially. Yeah. <laughs> they, they had all these, like, what I found to be incomprehensible titles, though they always had these sort of scientific or philosophical or entomological reasons why it had to be called that. So I said, oh, well, let me do, you know, my sort of way, but in a sort of Brooklyn funny way. And so I came up with Schlingenblangen. And um, and then it became schlang, schling schlang, and schlang in Yiddish means like a penis. And so, um, and as a, an organ has many penises, which sonore at the same time, it was, uh, my title is equally as, as fundamentally intelligent and <laughs> comprehensible <laughs> as their titles. You know, so that, it was that, I've always sort of used titles in a funny way, and, uh, and but realms. So pieces like Schindelbergen, I've probably done hundreds and hundreds of them, but then they're always in a different place, on a different organ, in a different way, a different length, but they're my schlings. And so they say, well, you want to do a schling, you want to do a strum? Yeah, then I have my strumming. Came up with that word uh, around 73, uh, it was sort of like, I started to do that technique I do when I like repeat um, a little bit like bell ringing technique, but you you play notes one after the other, and and so what would be the title for that? Because before that, I was doing a lot of arpeggios when I was living in California, and then I came to New York, and back to New York because I'm from New York. At Cal Arts, I was in California, and so that was my arpeggio. That's very weather is always nice, everybody's blonde. In those <laughs> days, it was before the Hispanic uh, uh, infiltration of them. And so it was very um, arpeggious. But then I came back to, New, to New, New York and I started to also continue pieces and all of a sudden these arpeggios sounded so fruity duty. I, I was embarrassed, I couldn't stand to listen to them in and then walk out on, onto the New York um, uh, uh, traffic jam. So they became, and, and this is really like, these are my compositional techniques, really. So that's why I tell you, because I'm not a, everybody has their pieces. So what happened is that maybe the New York um, traffic jams developed my piano technique, and it became strumming. And um, strumming was brum, brum, brum. so we, I, I forget how I, because we were trying to find a name, because I like, I mean, I like titles that are funny and, and also like, like dance off your tongue. So, so I came up with, I don't, I don't remember how, but strumming became. 
And then and now everybody took, so, you know, when I, that was the technique that I did. And so even just uh, last uh, two weeks ago, no, not even a week and a half ago, we opened the show in Vienna at the Kunsthalle. They have this big piece if ever you have a, I can do some advertising. If ever you have the time to go to Vienna the next two months, come and see my piece, which is called Gesamt Kunst Land. <laughs> I don't know if you all know what that sort of means, but Gesamtkunst is actually a total artwork that came out of the secession. And um, a little before even the secession line. But it was the idea that uh, art, uh, ar a lot of architects came out with that idea. Uh, and it was about, but it also Wagner, in the time of Wagner, it was a total theater piece. Um, but it means that a, a work, a total artwork. And as I did the piece, my show is right across the street in a diagonal from the secession in um, Vienna, and it's all glass windows, so I can actually see, one can actually see the secession, I don't know if you all know the architecture of the secession, with a golden ball above it. That was invent. That was done in 1902 by Ford Obrecht, uh, the architect for this new movement, which was eventually to be Joseph Hoffman and Gustav Klimt, Coleman Moser, um, Karl Tuschetka, and it lasted for about 30 years, and it was about doing total art, uh, a total work. If you built a house, it was also all the chairs, all the furniture, all the all the door handles, all the rugs, uh, everything. And so the term <coughs> then uh, came into plastic arts, and not just theater like Wagner um, used it. So uh, as my piece is um, across the street from where that started, and my wife in her family has a sort of uh, um, World Heritage Gesamtkunst work in Brussels called the Palais Stockwerk in the family. That word has become now part of my, um, because I used to, people of my generation, we called each, uh, ourselves multimedia, which is the, the, such a two P, P, P word. Gesamtkunst. Is that <laughs> Gesamtkunstwerk? Oh, it's so much more exciting. It's voluptuous. <laughs> But I didn't know that word back then. I would have used it years before, but in, in New York, you didn't use that. I mean, it would have been considered pretentious. But maybe it still is, but here in Europe, it's just so delicious. Yes. I love yes. the word. So anyway, the piece became, they asked me to do this sort of like a schmetrospective. I, I always make fun of the word because I'm, I'm um, superstitious. And I don't like things like one, so I say schmun man show, and I say, retrospective, and I do that because I, it worries me. It's like, I'm afraid if you say a certain thing that's too, in the end, then the gods will think it's over and you'll die. So I, I'm that kind of guy, I'm very superstitious somewhere. And so I'm afraid to say things that apply that th to the end. You know, I mean, like not so far after, um, um, from the Doors, um, uh, what was the name of the singer of the Doors? Jim Morrison. Jim Morrison, not so far after that famous song, the end, it was. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I'm allergic. So you wouldn't name the end? No, I wouldn't <laughs> name the end until I might put it in a, like an envelope after my death. Yeah. You could call that the end, <laughs> but I want to already be gone before I say, no, things like that. So I, this is this schmetrospective that I have that now at the, or Schwanman show in Vienna, um, needed a title. So it became, uh, I used two actually Austrian terms, Gesamtkunst, and the other one, which comes from Yiddish, is Meshukka, and Meshukka means crazy in Yiddish, in a nice way, sort of. And in fact, it's still in Austrian. I mean, when I first proposed that title, everybody 
knew every generation knew that word, even though there were hardly any more Jews in, in Austria, but the word stayed. So uh, it became Gesamtkunst Mischukeland. And so... Um, you mentioned yesterday that this is what interests you now, to make more of them. Like yeah, to well, combine no, what, all of yeah, your Yeah, but that was what interested me at the beginning. Yeah. But when you said multimedia, that, I mean, it seems to work now. I'm a certain age. There's internet. I have, there are young people, because everybody, I, I, I seem to have felt so much resistance uh, when I was young. I mean, the whole, the whole atmosphere, even though it's as rigid now as it was then to try to do something total, they're always trying to put you into a category, which I hate. Um, um, life is a category. I think death is a category. Okay, that I'm, that's, those are categories I'm okay with. But it's trying to specify that really. Um, so um, maybe this is a good time to, let's see. <laughs> system with these, what I was telling you, they were cables about as thick as these. And they didn't know that the piece, and I wasn't, didn't know the piece was going to go how it went. And so they were like turning like this, following me the whole time. And these, the cables at the end, they were afraid because it was like um, um, those um, snakes that um, uh, they became totally embedded in this sea of cables more and more. So the two of them were totally at the end. <laughs> Happily, I finished. I was like that, and they were like this, <laughs> with these enormous cables all around them in a spiral. <laughs> so you never know. And if, <laughs> I mean, it's funny because now, in, I mean, in the technology, it's so different. So does anybody have any observations or things they wanted to ask about the Friday, the work that they heard? I mean, um, did it sound like a, an organ? I mean, from where you were also, because you know where, from where you were and from where I was. I noticed, like uh, uh, the other day, I made a little chemoscope thing, chemoscope that was downstairs. And then I had my little edero near to the organ itself, and the acoustics of that uh, space were very, very special, well, as all, especially churches and places like that that haven't tried to make their uh, acoustics neutral, um, which I hate, actually. But I mean, for my particular work, it's neutral. Like, it's very, Did any of you know what you're going to hear and had already heard some of the records and then heard it live or or it was just um, any observation at all? Yeah, I thought live was pretty different. Ah. Like, I, I thought I heard something extra, not just the organ. Ah, that's, ah, yeah. good. See, that was what I had always, that's what I had planned from the 50 years ago. That's what I, I mean, that's what I heard. That's, um, and... First, and I don't know, is it in my head? Am I imagining, or... Is it's it in your inner... No, I think it, it is the relationship of... I mean, I, I can't, I'm not a... I'm not a scientist, but I think it's something that happens with... It's a phenomenological... Because, uh, mm -hmm. um, um... 
what was the name of this, your sociologist yesterday? Icho. Icho. Icho, he asked me what I thought about the, my recording from a very, very long time ago of strumming. And I said to him, you know, people, I mean, th that, that piece became very, somehow had a certain importance. And people actually often use one of the words that I hate. I mean, I have probably three hate words in the, in the vocabulary. And instead of my not saying them, I'll say them one, one time and I'll never say them. The three hate words I have, minimalism, composing, and improvisation. I hate the three of them because I don't feel it applies to me anyway, and I don't even know what they mean, and they, they're overused, and if they were to disappear, I wouldn't care, I would, I would celebrate. Okay. So, but the words, but about my strumming piece of 1974, the recording I made was on a Revox, my own Revox. I had a Burzen, it was made on a Burzen over a piano. This is something that's for, uh, now, even now, my show in Gesamtkunst in Schuckerland, there's a Bersendorfer Imperial. That means it's the largest piano of its kind ever built. It was built in Vienna. It's a company that existed from 1830 even till now, but though now it's owned by Yamaha because it's had a lot of financial problems. And it has nine tones lower than any other piano in the world. So instead of having 88 keys, it has 97. And it was invented in 1900 uh, under, so supposedly under the advice of Ferduccio Busoni, the composer, um, um, kind of a experimental and um, sonic post-romantic composer of the first part of the 20th century, and he gave the. Uh, he had a, um, an idea and he told the um, Bersendorfer family and the Bersendorfer family had already worked with Franz Liszt. They were a family very, who liked composers. Um, so they had a, sometimes a, a personal relationship and so they made this piano, which they make now to this day, that has absolutely n no reason to be made because there are only about three people in the entire world who use those other nine notes and I'm one of them, and uh, I don't get them, uh, I mean, and it's a fortune, this piece. So, uh, actually, we own one, my, my, my wife and I, in Brussels. And the company rented us one here at the, uh, at the Kunsthalle. But it's, um, uh, but the recording I made in 1974, it wasn't a very good quality um, recording. So it sounds very flat. I was trying to think of why after 50 years, I mean, it's not only my fault why they use that word minimalism so much, but it was because people sometimes when they describe, oh yes, you're Charlemagne Gossel, you're the one who did that piece where you play two notes for a whole hour and, uh, and that's all you play. I'm actually playing many notes. And if you hear it live, you hear like in a millions of like, amoeba doing strange things that are incomprehensible and you can't figure out is it in my head or is it really happening and that's how I started but when it's recorded it becomes flat it's like 3D becoming 2D mm -hmm. so that's a pr I mean happily even 2D people have found it interesting but when you're really there and it's 3D it's, some, it's, in a, it's something else entirely and there's no, even a better, even a better, like a B and W, uh, the best speakers in the world can't do it. Why? Because like here, there are two speakers. Imagine the piece that I played on Friday. I must have played eight, three hundred and eighty pipes. You'd have to have 380, because each one came from its own source. It wasn't shared. I mean, it shared the air, but it didn't share the, the membrane, because these are membranes. 
So you'd have to have at least 380 speakers here in the room f to and recorded one by one, and I've never done that because I don't have the budget, and so they tried to do it. I knew several people in California and in, those, in the period, of, like in the 60s, and uh, especially the 60s, there were a whole bunch of people trying to, to expand um, um, electronics and so sonorities that finally became, you know, the, the, your home, finally they decided five is enough. But in those days, there were people who tried, the famous, um, uh, the famous 1958 World's Fair in um, uh, Brussels, um, Le Corbusier, with Xenakis was a, an architect, um, was his assistant, and they commissioned Edgar Varez to do a piece in a in a special kind of an architecture, a pavilion, which became the uh, the Phillips Pavilion, and it was a piece specially for this pavilion that had a, something like a hundred speakers. In it. I mean, that people were interested in how that might like transform reality using electronics, but it just it never really, uh, it never took off because finally live is better. <laughs> live is cheaper in the end. <laughs> and then what are you gonna do? Yeah, I mean, you have to, this enormous system. Um, so it just never, so we, we, we got this, this home system that even now I, I don't think it's so popular anymore. Yeah. You know, the, the five one uh, home yeah, system. Yeah, yeah. yeah, surround system. I don't, I don't hear much about that anymore. It's just Years. No, yeah. now now it's uh, iPhone. Yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> now yeah. it's condensed. Again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, that even that didn't last such a long time. I mean, I'm sure some people have it, and it's great. You feel like you're in a movie theater when you're in the living room a little bit, but in the end, it's just it's got too much trouble. Anyway, so anyway, um, so that's what I've been. You know, that's my and bells do the same thing. You know, um. The other day, even in the recording I did in Innsbruck on this uh, um, Ice Belt Cavillon, the things that, because it was a fantastically enclosed, you're not always in a nice space, it was really a little like piazza in front of this um, San Jacob of Innsbruck uh, church. And so I played, and things that were happening phenomenologically were, yeah, you had, Am I crazy? I, I never. What? The, what is that? I, I. I'm not. Uh, I'm not very much acquainted with that. With sound like that, and that was my. Uh, I mean, that's where I arrived in my lifetime when I was hearing all that, you know, um, hymnen and um, all these. Um, the. 60s, 70s, 50s, 60s, Darmstadt, um, Columbia, Princeton, and all that post-serial music. I went another way, and even different from my colleagues that they tried to always put me next to, um, Phil Glass was very metronomic, um, Steve Reich, metronomic. Even Terry Riley, more fantasy, but metronomic. Um, John Adams, metronomic. And I'm sort of floating and looking for this, trying to find this un inexplicable, am I, am I dreaming or what's out there and what's happening? And so that's my, even in my sense of rhythm is based on looking for those magic things. So I have no real sense of rhythm if anybody really listens, because they sometimes use the word repetition. I mean, that's another word I, I forgot before. <laughs> repetition, because uh, I hate repetition. Just because I do something using the same thing a few times, but if I don't do it the same way any of the this, of this times, I think there needs to be other words for these things. 
Um, and so I, I think repetition, when you like beep boop 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 beep that causes repetition. But when you do what my thing, every second is like I'm, I'm out of time, I'm out of tune. So it, it has to be out of repetition. But what word, what word would you imagine is a word that means that you use something regularly, but out of repetition. You don't have a word. Okay. <laughs> um, so, for example. Um, anybody else have a, anything that came up during that time or about what they heard or felt? Or, like being in a church, was that difficult? That was great. Ah, that oh, it's was great. The best, uh, the best part. Yes. Why? This is my yes. impression. Yes. Uh, ah. Because it was like for me, it was like a black mass. A very black <laughs> mass. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm right. I'm but it's so a very elemental way, not in yeah. ideological or religious way. Mm. Uh, using uh, using a pop machine. That for me, organ is. It's a very pop machine. Pop. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, the of the bird. Okay, the yeah. of the of of, uh, of Christianity. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and that's why the black man. So, okay. Okay. And you used it as a, as an overtoning instrument, yeah. like a giant moog. Yeah. Uh, Which was actually my I knew moog. I knew Mobes, I knew Buchlis, I knew, I, I, I helped Serge uh, invent his um, oscillators in the 70s, the Serge, what became the do-it-yourself synthesizer. He was the, um, he was the disciple of, of Buchla. I was around over there, and what I wanted was, I wanted lots of oscillators that would play overtones. And so, I get, the problem was, first there, there are how to make an oscillator that was uh, uh, stable, because in those days, everything, the weather, the, so they developed that, and then each one was a fortune that I didn't have, you know. Uh, and it didn't have the architecture. Organs have an architecture that com it comes right with it. I mean, I mean, once you're there, I mean, they build a building normally, and then they build an organ for the building. And it's a kind of gazam or torx audio, a gazam song work there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is what I want to get out. Like overtoning, as your technique you were describing, like this, for example, this is one of your earliest pieces, and the organ concerto is very. Organ uh, concerto. Organ concerto. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I like it. Who says then am I accompanying? I'm accompanying the overtone. Then I just yeah. made me think of that. It's not a, a, a word. If it's an or, organ concerto, that has to be a concerto. Normally, you play with something. <laughs> and so I would have to say that I'm playing the organ with the overtone, so it's a concerto for organ and its overtone. <laughs> the overtone in its specific place, because it's the place that it's playing with. The, the space you mm, yeah. mm. So in both cases, you are playing with the room, mm. or with the room. church name. To touch on to the black mass, I'm so familiar with churches and organs from childhood, so I associate that with that. But then there's a concerto music, and what you did with organ, to me, was completely magic. A great, unique, magical experience, musical experience. And you know, totally different from anything I've heard before. So. Luckily now, it feels like that organs hate music. Oh, of course. Oh, of course. well, <laughs> because you've done something wonderful. But, uh, but, but strange enough, the organist um, here, he knows my music. Mm -hmm. He has actually played other instruments and so he's, he really knows it and he likes it. So he's a very rare, he's the generation, but even the generation, his generation, uh, 
it's taken a long time for young people to convince or churches and organs to allow me to play. Because they, it's in a realm, I mean, some people uh, uh, say that the two big organ voices of the, that time was Messian and my music. But Messian was an organist. He was a tutelar organist for 56 years. So he was part of the club because it's a very club oriented, like a Freemasonry, we were using the term, a Freemasonry um, club of, yeah. of, so if you're not a member of that club, you have a lot of problems. And Messian was a member. In fact, all his life, even though he was a professor, he traveled, he never gave up his chair as the organist of Trinity Church in Paris till the day he died. He was for 56 years. He was the nonstop official organist of Trinity Church, which was very important, even though, and then he stopped writing very much. He did these like fabulous. I, I got to hear, he stopped doing official organ pieces, but he, every, many Sundays, he liked to do pieces in the moment. So the, I, he, he called them, that word that I hate, improvisation, <laughs> but I called them pieces in the moment because I, I, I sensed, uh, I sensed, thanks, I sensed um, their momentness, but he came from that generation where they used the word um, improvisation still. He didn't, that wasn't a word that bothered him, but it bothers me that they use that for John Coltrane or, or Messian. Or, uh, it, it's used in too many, um, e every time, you know, well, um, I had a, 10 people came for dinner and I didn't know what to serve them, so I sort of improvised. You know, I mean, it, it, in those cases it works, but uh, I, you know, I, I'm not a good <laughs> so language, I, ha I find problems with language. I live a little bit in, in Hawaii, for example, and they have about 30, they, they have a very small language, a Polynesian language, but, but certain words like how the waves move in water, they have about 30 words for different, like if it's straight or it's marked. Uh, so certain cultures, become very sophisticated, even if though they're very few words, phenomenon that they're very uh, uh, um, attracted. attracted to, or because of their where, where they are and how they are, are very important in their life. They find many uh, ways of di uh, differentiating. That's why I'm always amazed this big global <coughs> Western culture hasn't been able to find anything from repetition <coughs> Um, uh, minimalism, I think, is one of the like the diseases of how can you be in such a diverse culture and everybody, you know, when you use that 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 word, people like go gaga. It's like you 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 hit some kind. Of, I don't know what that you know minimal restaurant, a minimal hotel. I mean, they, they, every, everybody goes gaga. It's so exciting. It's so exciting. <laughs> what well, then about the new trendy young generation of? I will use the word composers in yeah. the States that are called post-minimalists. Yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> but anyway, I always find that um, people like to use that term with me and then I always say it's like not leaving a tip after a, a, a meal. You, the, the waiter would say, what a fucking minimalist. You, know, you, didn't, you, know, you didn't leave a sufficient tip. That's for me. <laughs> but they would also use a lot of, for your music, for your music and performances, and you would use it also trance. 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 Well, well, that's no, that's what we used to use it. Yeah. Before Tom Johnson started to coin that word minimalist, because I knew several of the important minimalist artists of the 60s and their descendants, and in their work, it was like really geometrical and flat and and reductive, and that was really their, um, that, that, that was what they wanted to, to, to do, that was their direction, and it lasted for a certain time, but not a half a century. But not a half a century. No. 
So I started, you know, I can't imagine how hard it was for me. It took me 10 years. I just said, I'm not a min, I'm a max. I'm a maximal. Try it. Try it. Say it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It took 10 <laughs> years for like, for like journalists. Or, mm -hmm. Try it. It's the same M, but there's an X there and an A. Maximum, and so even now they say, "Oh yes, the minimal, um, the minimal composer." In another word, I hate uh, minimal composer, Charlemagne Palestine, who considers, who sees himself as maximal. Sometimes they do that. Yeah. I thought, so what are you listening to? What are you singing? This is, this is all minimal to you? I mean, it's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> so, but this is the phenomenon and hour of the blind and deafness of our society. It's one of the symptoms. I'm one of the proofs. It's like if you have an eye test. Somebody bring them in and see if they come up and look at me, watch me, all my guys and things, all my mashuka things, and I'm, yeah, oh yeah, it's minimal. Then you know that they're totally blind and that's it. <laughs> you mentioned they have diagrams, notes, etc. But many people don't know actually that you, you don't have written scores and that, that and all, all your music is attached to you, to your body, to your physical, psychological Well, and also experience. to the phenomenon of like that black mass church yeah. had a special kind of organ. You didn't know it had some, some of, the, of the buttons are pink. And, and some of the their little parts are, are he, he, he saw them. Yes, he does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're little red things. Really weird organs. <laughs> Well, no, I, I actually codified uh, uh, right before. I had numbers, I had little... Ah, uh, so the pink color is... Uh, oh, you mean why did they put the pink color in that yeah. thing? No no explanation, because uh -huh. others are white, they think somebody liked pink. And you tend to like them. Oh, I love them. I never, I never played a pink. <laughs> I, think it, I never played a pink um, uh, organ. Well, it wasn't all pink. Pink and red. Oh, but I would have designed it. I mean, that's the kind of organ. I, I like watching something that looks nice when I'm, when I'm working. That's why I like to dress. You know, I like to see colors. And I mean, if people don't like colors and like black, that's interesting too. But I would, every day, for an everyday diet, I prefer a color for black. What is the role of your teddy bear author and oh, 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 their divinity? What is the role? What, 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 what do you think is the role? Do they have any role? They just sort of sit there? Do, they, do, do, do objects in front of you, they, what is the role of, of a painting in, when you go to a museum? What's the role? I mean, you use the, an interesting term. No, 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 the interesting yeah. word is role. Yeah. Like role. Yeah. How, wh what does that mean in this case? Like, like an actor is, has a role. Okay, the purpose. Yeah, yeah, okay. So what is purpose. the purpose of teddy bear uh, author yeah. in the church, in your performance? Well, if it wasn't a teddy bear author, if I put an elephant, if I put a, um, a, a Maserati, yeah. okay. No, no, so I ask you, you you're, you're watching. What does it, obviously well, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to communicate something yeah, visually, yeah. right? Yeah. Already. So it's like, a, and what if I put a, uh, you know, um, a Picasso in there. What would, what would that mean to you? That it's a rich church, first of all. Uh, no, so, so you, I, leave, uh, you leave the, the deciphering to us. Oh, certainly, I leave the deciphering to you. I mean, I'm, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, the, my role uh, is that I do. I like. That's why I don't like the word composing. I do. And what I did, what I did on Friday was to do. And these are all. Dudes. There are historical things, which would be another story about why I like and how I was born a Western child, very much influenced by Eastern indigenous and societies where there is an entire gesamt life was born, where you pray, you you dress, you sing, you dance, you sculpt, you live, you, uh, 
your animism um, all connected, that is much less in Western society and more in other societies that I've become in my lifetime uh, acquainted with. So, I mean, why does, do Hindus have Ganesh? That's like an elephant god with a, a tummy like mine and a head like a, what's the role, do you think, of Ganesh in Hinduism? No idea. Uh, okay. Well, that's, a, that's a good answer. Yeah. So I would say so that... I have the idea about children. Oh, you do? So tell me that idea. I'm curious. Oh, no, 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 I'm curious now. Well, your idea. Right. Okay. Is that teddy bear voodoo? You just explained... Teddy bear voodoo. Is that, is that what she used the word yeah. voodoo? I like that word. That's a word I like. <laughs> I would prefer to be a voodooist than a composer. <laughs> that would be much, but voodoo, but people who are really into voodoo probably wouldn't like it. Yeah. And they, they, <laughs> pink voodoo and all this sort of guy. They have the soundtrack already. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's it. On the same <laughs> slide. <laughs> but some already named you a shaman. Yeah, but then they named others also. I, yeah. For a long time, it was really funny because in video, when I first started these pieces, they called some of my pieces shaman, and then Na Namjoon Park didn't like that they called me shaman, so he became a shaman. He's older <laughs> than me. He had, he stay, even say he invented video, so I had to give up that work. I mean, so he, he, he had would, to be he would, I had to. I'm, I was sort of like a shamanette or something. <laughs> he was the shaman, and I was the shamanette. <laughs> Because in art, you know, there's oof, it's a lot of, a lot of um, clashes of who's what in the in the military structure of uh, who did first what and when and oof, and I, I was bounced around a lot with that. Yeah, because you could say like this piece, you could put it in a, in the in the art categories, you know, like in the video art, but you could also put it. It's very performative. It, you could put it also in the performance art. So I wonder, how were you? I mean, how did they gravitate you in these fields in the seventies when you started? Because you you were acquainted with Marina Abramovic, with Dula, mm -hmm. with whom you performed in Maribor a couple of years ago, etc. No, I met M M Marina, and um, she was a street artist. She was at um, um, the Parco um, in Rome, what's the name of that place? Um, Villa Borghese. She was a street artist. I was doing a piece in a, an official festival, Contemporanea, in the parcheggio, the uh, parking garage of the Villa Borghese. And upstairs, I w there was this woman uh, had a little table with an, uh, a pen knife, pocket mm -hmm. knife, and she was doing this piece on the street. She had not yet really emigrated to uh, to the West. We could say she had just come from Montenegro, but she was doing this piece. And actually, the, the story goes is that she and I started to talk. And I said, I have to go downstairs now and play again because I was on a, um, I was to be next. This was a, I was there with Simon Forti. I did a piece with, uh, and I was, we were supposed to do one more in the late afternoon. And I went downstairs in the parquetra, which was fantastic, <laughs> to play the Berzendorfer while Simon danced. And at a certain moment, which never happens, I was working on one of my strummings, and my finger slipped, which it never does. I mean, slipped to the point where you heard a kind of a false note, a, a, a mistake note. Because I always include everything in my, oh, that's not a mistake. Like, like those two little, did you notice those two little stop action things that were in that piece? When it just stopped for yeah. me for a second and then it continued, that's not an, uh, th that's some magical thing and I like it. So I hope it continues to, to do that. But I, that wasn't my idea. That was the machine and whoever, the machine god. Anyway, so um, I, I, 
finish that piece and I go back upstairs and I'm sort of amazed. And I go and I see this woman who I didn't even know her name at the point, or what she was, probably maybe Marina. And she has a, um, she has like a little band of tissue around one of her fingers. And she said to me, I said, what happened? No, this never happens to me. I, um, I, the knife uh, cut my finger. And so I said, it's funny, son, that, that never happens to me. I'm, I missed a note and I sort of made a, a mistake. And so she said, well, when? And so we tried to, rem in the, the last half an hour that had passed, that had happened, we seem to have imagined that it happened at the exact same moment that I was below and she was above. She cut her finger and I forced the note. And that's how we became friends actually. After that she, mm -hmm. uh, she said, well then you're like my brother. <laughs> and so we remained friends. Now it's, I think it was around 1970. It was about, just about 40 years that that story happened. And then I met Ulai after. Uh, not even with her, I met Ulai differently, and then eventually, of course, they became a couple. And I've known them for years and years. And then Ulai, um, and I sang, I, 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 I forced him to sing at the performance of the Mary Boy um, some years ago. When I was mm -hmm. And uh, he lives here sometimes, I don't know. Do, 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 does anybody see him here anymore? Because he married this woman, woman Lena, but I didn't even contact her because it was a very strange experience. Um, I, I mean, I'm pretty good always about making sure that I get paid for my events and to work it out, or if it's for free, then I do it for free. But they made a whole big deal, she made a whole big deal to invite me and, uh, and to watch for, for the singer Mary Boy. And then they did this whole official thing, and I had to go to the to the Belgian embassy and everything like that. Was her name? And then we we never got paid. <laughs> I thought that was funny too, because Ula is always an artist so involved with artists' rights that I I thought it was funny that of all the people I should get screwed with um, it was his new wife. And but you know. Out of this European capital of culture of Maribor, a lot of people got screwed up. Oh, yes. <laughs> 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 Her name is Lena Pislak. Does anybody know? Yeah. Ah, Pislak. Yeah. 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 That's Ulai's wife. Yeah. 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 That's Ulai's wife. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, okay, so it's empty. I mean, uh, and I didn't know that I was like part of a, you know, a team of She lives, yeah. they live, um, the first house near the Dragon Bridge. Oh, yes? Yeah. Ah, we were there, yeah, twice. Yeah. Ah, the first house near the dragon. On which side? On the, oh, other on side the dragon's the head. The yeah, dragon's on, head on side. The other side of the market. The ah, market okay. ah yeah, 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 yeah. Ah. She has some kind of like an office or something, too. She's like, yeah. It, it's yeah. all there? Yeah, I think it's all there, yeah. Mm -hmm. But does anybody ever see Ula here? I was told. He is, he was ill, I mean, he has this cancer, unfortunately. Yeah. And he doesn't really take care of it, because um, he likes to smoke and he likes to drink. And I, don't, I think that he is resistant to change his, I would also do that, I mean, if tomorrow, um, I would be resistant, I mean, I love to drink. I did give up smoking. So you don't use the special... Oh, yeah, I haven't used that for 35 years. Really? It's still in my yeah, Wikipedia. Yes. They talk about drink. So whenever I hear, watch that, you know, he takes, he smokes these cigarettes from Indonesia. I know that the critic has never seen me, met me or anything. Because anybody who's seen me or met me in the last 35 yeah. years knows that I don't do that anymore. I guess. <laughs> Especially that special um, <laughs> cigarette. So. <laughs> So that shows you that often people who are critics and they have such an important um, role in you in people all over the world knowing who you are 
don't know you at all. <laughs> so that's like a funny, a funny little ha ha ha. <laughs> but maybe that's because you know smoke is is house private stuff. So maybe he saw you on the concert and you didn't smoke, and the treaty thought like, what? Well, maybe today for no, this performance yeah, he that's didn't. A, that's a, no, I think you're <laughs> just these people who like this photographer who comes quickly and doesn't stay. Yeah. So uh, you know, oh, yeah. give me quickly a photo, and then it'll become my, you know, if it's a good photo. Ah, a wonderful portrait. He doesn't even know what I do. You know. <laughs> No, but no, it's not against him. It's just it's a phenomenon that it's that we find in our. W were you ever asked to to do to write a piece for somebody else, for an, a small ensemble soloist, or well, or that uh, one of your pieces that was recorded and released that somebody else would perform well, it? Well, I've had sometimes people play strummings. Mm -hmm. And they normally they have to, because there's no music, you have to come and work with me. Yeah. And I've done that a little bit like Indian musicians do that, and different mm -hmm. like indigenous musicians, oral tradition musicians. Even in the Jewish tradition, there are some cantorial traditions where you go and you, s you sing with the chazan and you learn it next to the chazan. There is some notation, even Lamont Young and Terry Riley did that with Prana, mm -hmm. and there's no real, um, so actually now I'm gonna play another version of this where I'm carrying the camera that was done then 30, let's see, 2007 years later in color. That's called, um, what is it called? <laughs> I forgot to know. Um, I'll find it. It's called, it's called Ritual uh, in French, actually, because I did it in France at the time. It was, it was called Ritual dans le vide. Um, you were still smoking here at huh? that time. Huh? Were you oh, still you mean smoking? Uh, because I, I, I breathe heavy. No, 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 just. Was I smoking? Yeah, I was still smoking. Uh, cigarillos. Five or six of little cigarillos a day. Little Davidoff things. No. People were always buying little Davidoff, so I was sm smoking the best killer um, <laughs> cigarillos, okay. mini cigarillos in the world. I have so many left, uh, they're just sitting there, getting wasted. So that was in actually, I was invited, there used to be this fabulous um, sort of foundation in France called, named after the composer Pierre Henri. No, Pierre Chauffeur, who was, uh, the, um, who was one of the founders of uh, Musique Concrète, which means using um, uh, different sound effects and things around and then l electronically um, manipulating them. And there was another guy um, who didn't even know very well um, Pierre um, Chauffeur and named the foundation after him. And you could go to this, it's where uh, Citroën was, um, the, the region near to Belfort and um, in the center of France. Peugeot. Oh, Peugeot. <laughs> Peugeot. And um, they had a big, uh, like, um, Maison de Maitre, like a chateau, and they invited artists to come for 20 years to do projects in media, and they invited Lord and I, and we stayed there for about a week. And this was an ancient company of, um, of sewing machines and things made with enamel that had gone buzz called Yappi. It had been very famous in the early part of the century. And it was now, like you see, a, an emptiness. It was one of their factories, and so I was attracted by the emptiness of this, it was even almost a village full of mm. places like this. 
and so it's called then uh, Ritual in the Emptiness. And, uh, by then, I'm using the small camera to record, and I'm running it and holding it myself. There's no uh, editing. Um, the divinity, two of the divinities that are here today were there. That was like, they did that piece 15 years ago now, 14, 15, so they age. They, I've aged more than they do. They don't seem to <laughs> age exactly. Can you finish the story of the divinity? Finish? There is no finishing the story of the divinity. Well, there is a funny story, actually. <laughs> a funny story that only came later. Because I found out, here I am a child, like every child, playing with my toys. I hate that word, too. Um, I prefer divinities to toys. Well, there are things that are toys, but these guys aren't toys, they're divinities, but okay. Uh, and so I start, like all kids, to like my favorite bears and things when I'm a child in Brooklyn, in a certain neighborhood in Brooklyn, which is near to what they call Brownsville, East Flatbush, um, which is still not a neighborhood that the art, arty farty world has come to because Brooklyn is very big. Now Brooklyn is the cultural capital of the world. Right? When I was a kid, it was the violence and um, uh, race, um, uh, race uh, conflict capital of the world 50 years ago. Now it's the place to be. But my neighborhood is still um, so far from like it's tw 12 miles from the uh, Empire State Building. Um, I once could, I did that because I was brought up in this neighborhood that was like a refugee neighborhood, it was Jewish refugees near to then what was now encroaching on a new um, Jamaican um, uh, people who had come also to refine the American dream, the Brooklyn dream. And so it was, uh, uh, but in that neighborhood there was nothing cultural, unhappily. There was television already. Um, uh, my mother wanted me to be more cultural. M my parents were born in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, my father was born in uh, Odessa, and his family moved to, to, to New York, and most of them moved to Brighton Beach, Coney Island, which is what we even now still call Little Odessa, on the Atlantic my mother was born in Minsk, and she, her uh, mother was born in Krakow, so not so far from, uh, from me. And then she married my grandfather from Minsk, and they went to New York to all, uh, before the Russian Revolution, to find a better life, and on boats, and tearing up their papers, so not so different as what we see here in the uh, my father's side, they were, I don't know if many of you know the film Potemkin and the, the famous um, State. conflict between the boat and the uh, uh, shore of, uh, of, um, of workers and um, my father's side of the family right after Potemkin decide to, um, though we don't know the details, decide to emigrate to America. And on my mother's side, they come a few years later, but just before the, the Russian Revolution. And so they settled in the uh, Lower East Side. I don't know if any of you have been to New York City, like Cats of Delicate Bison, and uh, a whole bunch of like, uh, there's even now a museum of tenants, museum. They were born just like three blocks. And then they moved, like my generation of my parents, they, they, you were like six people in a room and things like that, and push carts on the street, you know, people that just love. So there was too much, so people started to move when you were younger, members of the family got younger, you had children, a lot of them started to move to Brooklyn because it was, it was cheaper, you, you had one tree or two even, and uh, so it became, a, but then it was a different kind of, uh, the mafia, there was, there was a Jewish father worked for the Jewish Mafia. 
the building and my mother had come from textiles and her father had a awning shop in Williamsburg. Williamsburg now is one of the most, that's like Monaco. In, <laughs> if you have a place in, it's like you have a house in Monaco. <laughs> but that's where my grandfather had his sweat, had his um, awning sweatshop in Brooklyn. Um, and so, I'm, let's go back. I'm a kid in Brooklyn playing with my toys. Then eventually I, 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 I sang a lot and because of that I won a scholarship to the High School of Music and Art, which was also in Manhattan. And all, then after that I'm all in like the cultural, all my student friends, their fathers, mothers won Pulitzer Prizes or on Broadway, or things like that. So um, and all of a sudden I'm in a cultural environment and I was a good student. I, uh, I, I absorbed all that and became but my mother wanted me to be cultural, and I was always curious about everything. So it, it finally worked out, and I became who I became. But I had to move out of that place, because that 12 miles away could just as well have been um, you know, in the mountains uh, of Tyrol or here or someplace out in a, in a farm. Uh, nothing, no connection. But now I'm playing with all these toys, and. and and then, but they talk, I communicate with my parents like that, and then my mother says he's getting too old. I'm gonna make the story fast because I wanna get uh, to the last part of the story, which is the story, part of the story which only now is really interesting and important uh, for the future, uh, even at Expo Hut next year at the Jewish Museum in, in New, New York City, which is just down the street from the Guggenheim. Uh, so I play with these toys, I'm too old, my mother tr gets rid of them, as I get older again, I, somebody gives me a bear that has blue eyes like mine, I return, I get involved again, and now I'm, I'm in university, and it becomes sort of, I start doing performances, and these guys, I call them the guys, even though some are gals, too, guys are gals, they're, they're with me group, the early group, then there's a red suitcase, as you know, there's a little red suitcase, then starts this tradition of that I'm always traveling with a group of my family, so then they become my family from toys, they became guys and gals, and then became my family, and then I traveled with this family, and I began to become a trademark of this Meshuggah guy who makes all the sound, performances, always world war traveling with this red suitcase with all these weird toys, and um, that becomes me. And then in 1986, 87, um, it becomes possible because of, um, uh, I'm invited for Documenta, and finally they've decided, it's right after Joseph Boyce and Andy Warhol did. They, they did several months one to the other, and they decide on a, um, on a uh, documentary with more performance and media to make it more equal, they give up a job to a woman named Elizabeth Yapa who has had a, a Malkari of a performance, a kind of transitional museum in the, in the 80s, we could say. A place where you could do all kinds of performance and un inexplicables or explicables with your body, with use anything, it was a, an open to all possibilities. And she became the assistant uh, director of Documenta, she invited me, and I go to the Steiff Teddy Bear Company in um, Germany um, with a project that I would build this uh, bear with three heads and two bodies, and I arrive and I get to meet, through lots of help, I had to have intermediaries who, who called the president of the company because of this guy coming out of nowhere to work with the most important um, teddy bear company in the world. They're the ones with the, um, uh, the button in, in the ear. They're also one of the most expensive in the world. They still exist. They're near Stuttgart. So I went and I met um, the chief designer who was the um, 
great nephew of Margaretha Steiff, who was a woman who had polio, who actually started the company. And so uh, I arrive, and we have a meeting, official meeting, and he uh, asked me about myself. I said, yes, I come from Brooklyn, and uh, from Brooklyn, you said. Uh, yes, um, I come from a place that's sort of called East New, New, East New York, Brooklyn. He said, I said yeah, um, well, uh, I have to tell you, um, people think that we invented the teddy bear in 1902, but we actually didn't invent the teddy bear that time. There's a couple from Eastern New York in Brooklyn called the Mitchkins, and they invented the teddy bear. And so uh, I only learned this like in 1987, so I'm already 40 years old, and I've been already traveling. Later on, I find out that not only did these people live in Brooklyn, but they live, now there's more and more um, the, in the Jewish virtual library uh, um, uh, internet site, you can see the whole story of this couple who were not related to me specifically, but they also came from the same part of Eastern Europe earlier than my parents. And so I was actually born three kilometers, two or three kilometers from where the teddy bear was invented. Um, and so in 1902. So it, if one were to take my Meshuggah philosophy or that I'm sort of, I have Charlotte world and I'm sort of my own tribe and I've been going around the world doing my, you know, that's my, one could be crazy enough to also say then that the teddy bear is my uncle. Archetype. My Archetype. Well, yeah, but also my uncle. He comes from the same neighborhood from Jew. <laughs> he's a Jewish. He's a Jewish bear, and uh, and he uh, he has a little bit of a nose sometimes too, you know, like we have. <laughs> and uh, he came from my neighborhood, so um, there. Uh, so. The funny thing is, is that now I'm going to have a show at the Jewish Museum in New, New, New York, as I know Claudia Gould, and it's now it's a very progressive uh, Jewish museum. It's not just any old. It's they're very much into contemporary art and stuff like that. And so I'm working with a guy who's been there the longest time, Norman Clayblad, and he knows about my how these toys <laughs> um, have been following me all over my life and. And then I happened to tell him, you know, that they're the original teddy bear that the, the, the people who, they asked Teddy Roosevelt, because it's named after the president, at a certain moment in history, you have to we'll read Jewish virtual library, teddy bear, and you'll, he'll tell the whole story. It's a very beautiful story, but that's a whole afternoon seminar. That's a half an hour story. So. Um, and so... In the Smithsonian is the bear that the company sent to Teddy Roosevelt. And I went to go and see it with order several years ago. And now we're going there, the Jewish Museum of New York will be able to lend it. And so we're going to try to find a way as the, I'm an artist in the last you know, 50 years, international now, I come from a certain neighborhood in Brooklyn. And I do all these different things. Gesamt Kunstler, blah, 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 blah. And then these divinity toys uh, um, come from his neighborhood, invented by a Jewish couple that could have been his aunt and uncle. And so if he has his first Schmann Man show at the Jewish Museum, maybe he should be there with his. Uncle Teddy, the real one from the Smithsonian. <laughs> and that's what we're working on to make that work. And I'll have my Schmunman Schmetrospective with my Uncle Teddy divinity toy. Um, and so I think that's a good way to. Uh, yeah, because it's one o'clock. Yep. So any other last little. And there's the cognac that I drink always. I do still drink when I play cognac. 
it was there, that's the rest of the bottle, and you're all invited to take a little schnapp schnook <laughs> uh, in um, honor of our having done this all together, if you like, if you don't, you don't have to, but it's there. I'm even going to, normally I dump it just for the taste, or the little pits in it. <laughs> Exceptionally on a Sunday afternoon. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, no, don't clap. Take care. <laughs> and, you didn't, and you didn't clap so well the other day. You were lousy clappers. You were lousy clappers now, so I don't want you to have the satisfaction of finishing with a good clap. <laughs> yeah, put it back in. Ah, put them in the new there. Yeah. Okay. So they have a little song for you. Okay. Are you are you are you on? Yes. Okay. No clapping for the moment. Wait, it's not finished. No clapping. It's not finished. Bye. 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 Bye.